This podcast recounts true crime events that contain adult themes. The content may be graphic or explicit and as such may not be everyone's cup of tea. Viewer discretion is advised. Also, spoiler alert. A blank peaceful screen is interrupted by the monologue of a young man stating, quote, I was eating a tomato at tea time a few weeks ago and I suddenly realized that mummy is not dead at all. Just very, very mysterious. The scene then cuts to New York City in 1946 and introduces us to Barbara Daly Bakelin, a Manhattan socialite married to Brooks Bakelin, the heir to the Bakelite fortune. They are preparing for a night out with a group of equally upper-class friends, and it's clear that the couple's relationship is tense. It is then revealed that the narrator is an older version of the couple's infant son, Tony, who is reflecting on the beginning of his life and the suggested eventual downfall of his family, saying of his parents, quote, He was cold and dark, and she was warm and light, and I was little Tony. Thus begins Tom Kalin's 2007 drama Savage Grace and the story of Barbara and Anthony Bakeland. This is Crime Cine. Barbara Daly was born September 28, 1921, and raised in Boston, Massachusetts. Her father, Frank, died by suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning when Barbara was either 10 or 11. Dates differ between the event happening either in 1931 or 1932. However, he purposely framed the event as an accident so that Barbara and her mother could claim the life insurance money. They soon moved to New York City and lived in the Delmonico Hotel, where Barbara worked to become a prominent socialite, attending many high society parties in the area. She regularly modeled for magazines Vogue and Harper's Bazaar, and was at one point considered by many as one of New York's 10 most beautiful girls. However, things were not all picture perfect, as the scenario would suggest. Both Barbara and her mother suffered from various mental health problems and were private patients of famous psychiatrist Foster Kennedy. Despite this, Barbara continued to seek fame and fortune, eventually doing a screen test with actor Dana Andrews, famous for 1944's Laura and 1946's The Best Years of Our Lives. The test did not result in a career in film, but did lead Barbara to a friendship with fellow aspiring actress Cornelia Dickey Bakelin, whose only credit I could find was 1944's Cover Girl. Dickey introduced Barbara to her younger brother Brooks, who was training as a pilot with the Royal Canadian Air Force. The Bakelins were famous and well-known as the grandchildren of Leo Bakelin, the inventor of Bakelite, and, quote, the father of the plastics industry for his revolutionary research in modern plastics. Barbara and Brooks fell in love and began a romantic yet tumultuous courtship. The couple married in California when Barbara lied to Brooks that she was pregnant. They set up in a luxury apartment on the Upper East Side in New York and held lavish dinner parties for friends like Greta Garbo and Tennessee Williams. At the time, Barbara listed her profession as a painter and Brooks worked as a writer, though the New York Daily News quotes, they were quite a pair. He was a writer who never wrote and she was a painter who could not paint. Barbara became well known among her friends in New York society for her unstable and antagonistic personality, often lashing out aggressively and suffering severe bouts of depression. Both she and Brooks drank heavily and cheated on one another, but they remained married. The couple's only child, Antony, was born in August of 1946, and from the summer of 1954 onward, the three of them lived in a seasonally nomadic lifestyle, maintaining their home in New York, but living mainly in Europe. They rented houses and villas in London, Paris, Zermatt, Cape Dantibes, and Italy, and continued to live quite extravagantly. Nothing changed, Barbara and Brooks continued to antagonize each other, and Antony most likely suffered as a result. During a party while they were based in Paris, Brooks met an English diplomat's daughter who was 15 years younger than him and requested a divorce from Barbara. She, as a result, attempted suicide and Brooks terminated the affair. In 1967, when the family was based in both Switzerland and Spain, 20-year-old Antony met Australian Jake Cooper, who introduced him to hallucinogenic drugs and the two began an affair. When informed of this by a friend, Barbara traveled to Spain to bring her son back to Switzerland. However, Antony was found not to have his passport at the French border and was arrested and placed in jail. After returning to Spain, Barbara seemingly accepted Tony's relationship with Cooper, but highly encouraged him pursuing a relationship with a young Spanish girl named Sylvie. While Tony remained uninterested, Sylvie did catch the attention of a much older Brooks. 
They soon began an affair, but were discovered by Barbara in February of 1968. She again attempted suicide, but this time Brooks did not fold. He pursued a divorce, which caused Barbara to slip further into a severe depression and another suicide attempt, from which her friend Gloria Jones, wife of author James Jones, saved her from. Brooks and Sylvie went on to marry and have a child together. In 1969, Barbara met Samuel Adams Green, an American art curator with whom she started an affair. After six weeks, however, Green had had enough and broke things off. Barbara, not pleased with how things ended, continued to pursue Green, supposedly even going as far to walk barefoot across Central Park in the snow wearing nothing but a lynx fur coat to demand entry into his apartment. Barbara and Antony's relationship was always an intense one, with Barbara placing immense pressure on her only son due to her efforts to maintain a perfect reputation. It's also evident that Barbara's genetic history with mental health affected Antony, as he had been diagnosed with schizophrenia by the time he was 21. His sexuality displeased her, as she had no doubt planned his life out for him, and this did not include any homosexual relationships. She attempted to fix her son, first with Sylvie, and later by hiring prostitutes to have sex with him. After these attempts failed, Barbara allegedly tried to rape her son while the pair were living in Mahorka in the summer of 1969. This, however, cannot be proven, as Barbara nor Tony are here to defend themselves. Barbara's sister-in-law, however, does recall a conversation in which Barbara allegedly claimed, quote, You know, I could get Tony over his homosexuality if I just took him to bed. Crimeinvestigation.co.uk puts it best, I think, by stating, quote, Whether an incestuous relationship between mother and son actually happened is debatable, as some close friends believe that Barbara simply enjoyed shocking people with such admissions that may have been fueled by fantasy and pathological attention-seeking. The ever-mounting tension between Tony and Barbara escalated further in the early 1970s, with him trying to throw her into traffic outside of her penthouse in Chelsea, London in July of 1972. She was only saved by his general weakness and an intervention by her friend Susan Guinness. Metropolitan Police arrested Tony for attempted murder, but Barbara refused to press charges. He was subsequently admitted to the Priory Private Psychiatric Hospital, being released quickly thereafter. While living at home, Tony took sessions with a psychiatrist to sort things out. This doctor became concerned that his condition had not lessened but actually heightened and warned Barbara on October 30th of that year that her son was capable of murder, stating, quote, I think you're at grave risk. Barbara coldly replied, quote, I don't. Eighteen days later, her dismissal sealed her demise. On November 17, 1972, 25-year-old Antony murdered his 51-year-old mother, stabbing her once in the heart with a kitchen knife, killing her almost instantly. He was found at the scene of the crime by police, allegedly ordering Chinese food, according to a detective on the case. He confessed and was charged with her murder, but was later found guilty of manslaughter. The difference being murder is killing purposefully, while manslaughter is killing as a result of recklessness. Tony was institutionalized at Broadmoor Hospital until July 21, 1980, when a group of high-profile friends helped secure his release. He did not seem to be better off mentally, however, some claiming he would even ask about his mother during his stay at Broadmoor, as if he believed she was still alive. 33 at the time of his release, Tony traveled to New York to live with his grandmother, 87-year-old Nene Daly, who by all accounts defended her grandson in his inherent goodness. Six days after his arrival, on July 27, Tony attacked Nini with a kitchen knife after she refused to allow him to make a call to London. He stabbed her eight times and broke several of her bones, but she survived. Tony was charged with attempted murder and sent to Rikers Island in New York. The Rikers psychiatric team was expected to aid in his release on bail at a court hearing on March 20, 1981. It was adjourned, however, by a judge due to a delay in the transfer of medical documents from the United Kingdom. Tony returned to his cell at 3.30 p.m. on the same day and was found dead 30 minutes later, suffocated by a plastic bag. It is unknown whether or not Antony died by suicide or murder, but it is ironic to note that the method in which he died also brought his family their fame. Plastic. Tom Kalin and Howard A. Rodman were inspired to write a movie based on the Bakeland murder after reading Savage Grace by Natalie Robbins and Stephen M. L. Arison. The film stars Julianne Moore and Eddie Redmayne as Barbara and Tony and was an official selection at the 2007 London Film Festival, the 2007 Sundance Film Festival, and the 2007 Cannes Film Festival. 
Savage Grace opened in a limited release on May 28, 2007 by IFC Films and globally grossed $1,432,799 of its estimated $4.6 million budget. It received mixed reviews upon its release, the Rotten Tomatoes consensus reading as follows, quote, Though visually compelling, the lamentable characters in Savage Grace make for difficult viewing. Barbara's former lover, Samuel Green, portrayed by Hugh Dancy in the film, wrote a scathing article about the film's release, pointing out various historical inaccuracies within the storyline, such as the menage a trois scene. Quote, It is true that almost 40 years ago I did have an affair with Barbara, but I certainly never slept with her son, nor am I bisexual. She started telling people she had had an incestuous relationship with her son as a way of curing him of homosexuality. But I don't believe she had sex with Tony. I think she simply enjoyed shocking people. He was in the process of pursuing legal action against the film at the time of his death on March 4th, 2011, at the age of 70. Now, y'all, this movie was a trip. Even the way it started had me taken aback, i.e. the tomato reference. It's set in this vein of high drama, but if anything, comes across extremely campy. It's shot and edited in a way that would suggest it was released in the 80s, but it came out in 2007. And yes, it is a period drama, but nonetheless. At first, I will admit I was not feeling it, but as time went on, I became enthralled with the terror that was this script. It's horribly written, but so damn entertaining that I couldn't look away from the train wreck of it all. Though I will give it props for giving me not one, but two Barba Pleases, just like its very similar camp predecessor, Mommy Dearest. Although it's very difficult to make Julianne Moore and Eddie Redmayne seem untalented, this film achieved that, so props to them taking on that challenge. The writers definitely leaned into the fiery, incestuous rumors that Barbara stoked in her lifetime. The conversations are inappropriate, and an NSFW scene comes out of nowhere. Fair warning to anyone interested in this film, incest does occur, and it will make you very uncomfortable. There's a handful of full frontal nudity, too, one scene in which felt like blatant homoeroticism, where the dad literally was drying himself off at the gym with friends and hiked his leg up to clean himself while maintaining eye contact and conversation with said friends. Though I will say that mental illness is no excuse for gaslighting an individual as this movie presents. As much dislike as I had for it, the film did provide me with a good many memorable moments, such as Barbara's journey and butchering multiple languages, the messy mess of a breakup in public after discovering infidelity, and my all-time favorite artistic choice ever taken in cinema, aka when Antony meets Blanca for the first time and she tries to seduce him with the power of music, but a timely introduction of the song Ain't Nobody Home by Howard Tate lets us know that Tony is in no means interested in what Blanca is bringing to the table, but rather ready to hand it all over to his friend, Jake. You can't make it up. While Rotten Tomatoes rates it a 38% rotten and Metacritic rates it 51 out of 100, I give Savage Grace a 3 out of 10 for the white bread script, but add 2 points for the fact this movie could be a camp classic, bringing it to 5 out of 10 spooks. Thank you so much for listening to Crime Scene A. All of the information you've heard in this episode comes from Tom Kalen's Savage Grace, allthatsinteresting.com, crimeinvestigation.co.uk, Murderpedia, The New York Daily News, Wikipedia, and of course, IMDb. The music you've heard throughout the episode is by my friend Colby. I'll include his SoundCloud in the description. And I'd like to dedicate this episode to anyone who has suffered from mental illness presently and in the past, because not enough attention is paid in full to the immensely complex world that is mental health. We can't change history, but we can educate for the future. I'm Alyssa Chester, and please be kind and stay enlightened. Thank <laughs> you.